of persons missing the point and the meaning altogether. Because we make it so simple that it almost lacks a requirement on our part to be committed to it. So Jesus has done the work, but he has not taken the work out of it for us. And we need to understand that. He's done the work of getting us positioned so that we can reach him and have this amazing relationship with him. And when we oversimplify it, we do a gross injustice to those whom we are witnessing. So I'd like you to turn with me now. This today is going to be a complex structure. But I promise you, it will bless your soul. I will take it slow because we want to get it. And for the most part, it is things that we know, but we don't always put into perspective. And this congregation is ready for this. We got some powerful teachers here. We got some powerful preachers here and teachers. And we're ready to go to this level. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 39 through 45. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 39 through 45. Hear the word of God. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown or planted in corruption or, or in a degraded state. It is raised or elevated, lifted, cultivated, trained, and prepared. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. That's salvation right there. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a life-giving spirit. Our thought today, raising up the last Adam. You may be seated. We have preached this passage of scripture from time to time because it has the entire concept of salvation in it. And also in the passage of scripture that we have here as our text today, we find that our natural body is one thing and our spiritual body is another. But together they form one union. And Christ died for us. Jesus did. The body died for us so that Christ, the Son of God, could ascend to be with God to give to us a picture of what salvation for us really is. Now, we do not have to die to in, 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 uh, entirely in order to get to God because Christ has showed us how. All we have to do is crucify our flesh, die to our flesh nature. That's the essence of what salvation is. When we stop taking orders from me, when I stop taking orders from me, can you say that? When I stop 
taking orders from me and begin to take orders from Christ in me, then I shall be raised. When we begin to accept the truth about God and his creation, the truth that God created both the seen and the unseen worlds, the visible and the invisible. As Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2 says, and the earth was without form, no visible shape, no matter, material good. The earth was without form and was void, didn't have any content, any substance. So here we had this priori material that God was going to use to create the planet. Then this priori material suspended in space before he even began to shape it into the world that we walk upon. When we begin to accept these truths, then it becomes easier for us to also accept what Paul tells us as he writes in our text, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 44. He says, there is a natural body, which is from this earth that God has formed. And there is a spiritual body, which is when God breathed into the natural. You know this already. And so then God placed a part of himself in the natural body and, and, and the body came to life and that's who we are. Paul tells us in this passage of scripture that the natural body is, is sown or, or planted here in this world in corruption. But, 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 it is raised up again in incorruption. That's salvation right there. That's what Christ came for. For us to get that, that, that raised spiritual body that's raised in incorruption because it is the breath of God in us. It is planted here in dishonor, Paul says, but it is raised in glory. In other words, the body is planted here in dishonor, but the spirit is raised in glory. What do you mean glory? The luminous, amazing light of God begins to shine in us as God reveals himself into us. Paul says it is planted here in weakness. That's why when, when, when the body is, is, is interred, at a, a, a home-going service, at a funeral, when the body is interred, uh, there's this saying that, 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 that the, the person does, they'll get a clump of dirt or dust and say, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, earth to earth. In other words, the natural body is going back to the earth. And then the, the preacher will say, and we look for the resurrection where we will see each other again. That's the spirit. That's the God-breathed part of us in there. And what Christ came for is so that this God-breathed portion of who we are begins to live while we are still in these bodies and not yet in the ground. That's what salvation is. When we begin to accept this as truth, then the time of our visitation, our journey here while we are planted in this world, will begin to have greater meaning for each of us. And we will begin to have a greater interest in accessing the supernatural power of God because it's, it's in us. And he has made himself available to us while we're here. Not only available to us, but he has made himself available within us. 
But he has given to us the power to override anything that he wants to tell us and show us because he made us free moral agents. He didn't make us slaves. He didn't make us robots. He did not make us clones. But free spirit life in these natural bodies. We find throughout the word of God that Christ came into this world of the natural in order to bring us into the knowledge of God, into a relationship with God that saves us from the natural. And as Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2 says, and the earth was without form, uh, uh, no visible shape. Then God is saying to us, listen, you're natural, but I'm going to give eternal life into you. The natural won't last forever, but the life in you will. And ultimately, God's purpose is to raise this life within us while we're walking in these clay bodies. To raise us into the very presence of himself with life eternal if we have the will to allow our spirit life to be raised up with him. God will do that. In John 6, verses 38 and 39, Jesus says, For I am, for I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Even those who die before he returns for us, even those who become released from the body before he returns for us. Jesus is saying here, Christ is saying, nothing is lost. Nothing is lost. So he first makes it plain to everyone that he came down from heaven. This tells us where he is from, a much higher realm than this world to which he has come. Then he says, I came not to do my own will. This means that he was on assignment here. Representing someone was even, who was even over him in his this higher realm that he had come down to us from. Who's the one over him? The Father. God the Father. So he, he, he uh, Jesus says to us here in John 6, 39, and this is the Father's will which has sent me, that I come here to you. So when he came, he came to do the Father's will. And the, the Father's will was that he show us who we really are through crucifixion, resurrection, walking among us and then ascending in front of our very eyes of those witnesses who were there. And then sending back the Holy Spirit to connect with God in us so that we can get the same thing ourselves. Two things here. Christ Jesus is telling us about himself and the Father. Two things. Number one, the Father is higher than me. I represent him here because it is he that has sent me here, but he's higher than me. Second thing he's telling us is what I'm about to tell you and what I'm about to do in your life here is the will of the Father for you. So he shows us. You have eternal life. It's inside you. You have become so constrained by what you see around you that you do not even realize that you are an eternal being that's in this creature. Jesus was saying, I've been planted here because you have been planted here. I'm on supernatural and divine assignment from the Father. Jesus is saying to us, I'm on a supernatural assignment here from the Father. I'm here to raise you from the natural 
earthbound you to the spiritual heavenbound you. And you don't have to die and be planted back in the ground in order to get there. He says, I'm going to do this, but only if you're ready to do the will of God the Father like I am doing the will of God the Father. Well, what was the rest of it concerning the will of God the Father for Christ coming down from heaven to us? Jesus tells us that too. He says that of all which he hath given me, that's in verse 39 of our text, I should lose nothing. Now, God is in Christ conforming the world to himself. Is that right? Some of us say he's in Jesus conforming the world to Christ. Well, the Father and the Son and the Spirit are one. If we be conformed to Christ, we will do well. Because we will have come to the understanding that now I am conformed with the one who came into this world from God. The Spirit being who is Christ, the Son of God, comes into this world into the natural body of Jesus. That's what Isaiah teaches us. We all know that. Is that right? He says, unto us a... And unto us a... Yes. Unto us a son is given. That's Christ from heaven. Unto us a child is born. That's Jesus from earth. God said, I'm showing you how this thing works. It, 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 it's simplistic, but we make it complicated because we want to be all theological and, and, and hermeneutical and, 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 and all of those 50 cent words that don't mean a thing to folk who just want to get saved. I just want Jesus. You don't have to tell me how to construct a sermon. You don't have to tell me how to construct a Bible study. Just show me Jesus. That of all that you have given me, I should lose nothing. It means that not one person who has accepted Christ as Lord and Savior is going to live a meaningless life that is in vain while they're here. Not even one. If you do not believe you are in this world for a reason, you've missed it all already. It is when we begin to turn our back on those things that have drawn us away from the inner self, from that, which, that part of us which has been breathed into us from God. Stillborns who are born into this world do not have, their, they're born into this world, we see the natural, but there is no life of God in them because only God can give life. So everyone that gets here and is breathing, that breath, that life has come from the eternal realm. I can't give you breath. I can procreate. And you will look like me or resemble me, but only in the natural and if I know God, then I'm responsible to train you up so that you can resemble him. Christ came so that we could get this. If I'm stillborn, God did not 
allowed me to come into this world with a destiny. For whatever reason, we weep when we have children that come forth stillborn, but trust me, God has a purpose in everything. So, all which you've given me, I should lose nothing. It means that we may start out making vain and foolish decisions in life, but we won't continue making decisions and choices in the vanity of our own carnal ignorance. Once we let the last man, the last Adam, rise up. First Adam was the natural man. The second Adam, the last Adam, was the spirit, the breath of God. Because the love and the holy purposes of the Father will not allow any of us to be lost whom he has given to the Son for salvation in order for the Holy Spirit to cleanse us, heal us, and deliver us. Because of that, God wants us to allow that second man, that second woman, to raise up in us, and then to lead us. And the reason he refers to them as the first Adam is because that's what we see first, the natural. Before I know who you are, I see you. I identify with your person, not your spiritual nature. Oh, there she is. There he is. And I can see you coming. You don't have to say a word. You can see me coming, and I don't have to say a word. And you will know who I am because you will recognize me. But once I really let the second Adam raise up in me, you have a different feeling when you see me coming. Even though you recognize the natural, you know that Christ is raised up in me. Even though I recognize the natural when I see you coming, I know that you're a child of God because I have experienced a relationship with you that tells me that you are in a relationship with the same God who I'm in a relationship with. Turn to the person next to you. Look right at them. Say, when I see you coming, and you see me coming, we should each know, here comes Christ. At least the image of Christ. So he's come to lead us and guide us and direct us through our time here in this fallen world because we're born into a fallen world. So he comes to direct us through it. We each have eternal life. And we are purposed of God to live a portion of it here in this present natural world that we can see now with our natural eye. But we have eternal life. And while we are here, passing through this natural world, we will experience some moments of conflict and opposition. And we will experience some moments of doubt and uncertainty. And sometimes we will even feel like it's just easier for me if I just make the decision to give up and to fail. It's just simpler for me if, 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 if I just stay in this position of defeat rather than to have the will to give myself to Christ. But if I do decide to remain in a position of defeat with my life, then I shall be refusing to give myself permission to come into God's higher position which is his divine purpose for my life. If it's easier for me 
to live a defeated life and not even try to overcome everything that I have had to face that has been purposed to hold me down, then I am not ready to live God's higher life for which purpose he put me here in the first place. I've got to get past all of the finding the easy, uneventful way. So drugs has got me, so I'm going to just let it have me. So anger has got me. I'm just going to let it have me. And God is saying, you can't do that. The natural has you. And you're not going to let the natural have you because the natural will have you living in eternal damnation. Because you were created to live eternally, not the natural. But the spirit you will live for. I believe that's, I believe that's in the Bible, isn't it? I will have to give an account for what I've done while in the body. And I will live either in eternal glory and joy or eternal damnation. Uh, and, and, and some translations say eternal torment. So the life inside me is going to live forever. What am I going to do with it while I'm here? I'm here for a reason. I'm in this natural crazy body that I got to scrub every day and put lotion all over it and do all this crazy stuff. I'm here in this thing. So what am I supposed to be doing in this thing while I'm here? Overcoming it and then helping someone else overcome it. And since we are predestinated, Paul makes that plain, Peter makes that plain, John makes that plain. Since I'm predestinated, that means God sent me here with a plan. So I need to get in touch with him from my spirit man to find out, God, what is this plan that you sent me here for? I must have volunteered for something before I got here. If I am eternal, if I have eternal life, where was I at with this eternal life before I got in this body? It's complex. And we oversimplify it. And so we get little Christ Christianettes. Instead of full-blown Christians. You know, when, when you got that little tight apartment and, and you put a dinette. You can't have a full-blown dining room. We, we, we have a dinette in our, in our house. God says, I want full-blown Christians. I don't want little Christianettes. Please believe me. Ten minutes, I'll stop. Please believe me. It is a far better and wiser choice that we make when we choose to have a genuine reverence and respect for the things of God. Please believe me. It is a more effectual decision that we make toward the glorious realms of God's eternity when we decide to have a high sense of regard for the purposes of God. Especially concerning our very brief journey through the short period of time that we're here in this natural world. It is important that we choose wisely and make wise decisions because we will leave this natural here and then raise up and give an account for what we did while we were in it. We must labor in the spirit. 
in such ways as to preoccupy ourselves with the things of God in our mind and, and in our heart so that we are godly affected by those pursuits that are not out of our own vain will but are of the will of God for us. We are preoccupied with so many different things that we want. And not too often ask of God, what is it that you want from me? If he tells me in his word that I was created to live eternally, because he breathed, is God eternal? Yeah. And if he breathed into the clay that gave me life, what does that make me? Eternal. On the inside. So then where was I before I got here? I was with God. Yeah. Yeah. What was I doing with him? I don't know because I lost all of that when I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So I must have volunteered to come in here because he predestinated me so that when I get back in touch with him, I can find my way back home after I accomplish my assignment. But we get caught up in all of the trappings of this world. The apostle Peter says it quite well to us when he says in, in, in 1 Peter 1 verse 17, and if you call on the Father who without respect of, per of persons judges according to every man's work, watch this, he says, Pass the time of your journeying through here in fear. In other words, in reverence and respect for the things of God. That's an interesting. Peter said, you got eternal life. You better be careful going through here. You may have never gotten busted. Maybe the law never caught you. Maybe your husband or wife never caught you. But God saw what you were doing when you were doing it. Do you think you got away? No. Pastor Robert, you're going to preach me say, I hope so. And if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work past the time of your journeying through here in fear. This, of course, requires of us each that we have a genuine desire for the will of God to be foremost in our lives. If we're going to pass through here with, with respect and reverence for God and the things of God, then we're going to have to have a genuine desire for the will of God to be foremost in our lives. When God's will has become your will, and what you will is what God wills for you, then having what you will becomes just a matter of speaking it to be so. I'm going to say that again. When God's will has become your will and what you will is what God wills for you, then having what you will becomes just a matter of speaking it to be so. Or as Paul says to the Romans in Romans 4.17, as it is written, I have made the father of many, I have made thee a father of many nations before him who he believed, even God, 
who raises the dead to life. Not after they've been buried. In the ground, some of us are buried in our own bodies. Who raises the dead to life and calls those things which be not as though they Oh, when we get that kind of relationship with him. When we don't mind sacrificing whatever we need to sacrifice because we've come into the realization that Christ and God the Father has sacrificed everything for us. And there's nothing here that's better by any stretch of the imagination than that which is waiting for me. When we get that mentality... Then we're willing to wait on God. And as Paul says in one place, I've suffered the loss of all things just so I can win Christ. And have him and be found in him. That's what we want. We have to sell out and not give it a second thought. We're trying to hold on to stuff. And God is saying, listen, you can't bring that stuff up here. Find out what I've got for you there. And if you have to live in a tent, if you have to walk and wear out one or two pair of shoes because that's all you got, Get in my will, and I'll take care of you. He will supply all of our need according to his what? In where? So it's not here in the natural realm. He know, in other words, he knows what you're going to need. He will supply all of your needs. See, once we leave this natural, we won't have any needs. So he's talking about the natural he will supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. That means when you need something dumped into you, he's going to make sure that you get that dump truck from glory backing up to your spirit and pouring out whatever it is that you need. And God has a way of knowing how to take the spiritual and make it become manifest as real. It should have already been the experience of most of us in here today that when we have put our trust in God about some things we may face from time to time in our lives and he has given us a sense of peace about it, then it is not unusual to us when God brings the matter to a good conclusion that honors and glorifies his purposes for us. In other words, no matter what we have to face, it's all right. God has got a plan for what's going to come out on the other end. We don't want to go through it. We don't want to deal with it. So we're constantly saying, this is going to pass. God's going to get me out of this. And, we, and while we're saying it, we're planning how we're going to do something. God is saying, be still. How are you going to worship me while you're planning how to get out of the thing? Why don't you just worship me? Why don't you just praise me? Why don't you just call to me? Why don't you just call on my name? Why don't you just pray to me and let me tell you how I'm leading you out of it for a purpose? Because if you plan your own escape, you're not going to get the lesson that you need to get while you're locked up in this thing. I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm five minutes. So when God brings us out there, he gives us a sense of peace about it. And he brings things to a good conclusion. God sees so much further.
farther down the road of life and time than we do. In fact, he sees all the way down the road. He made the road. And having the will, not, not just our own will, but having a will that is connected to God and his will it, it, it is not possible here apart from knowing that which raises us spiritually to ever higher and higher realms of a personal relationship with God. People saying, you, you're too holy, you're too holy. Then you say to them, you would not have said that if you were not holy enough. How you going to call me too holy when I'm doing my best to be in the will of God? And he's telling me don't drink, don't smoke, don't curse. Don't do this, don't do that. And you're talking about, well, you got all these restrictions on you. God knows how to purge me and cleanse me and free me so that he can mold me and shape me and give me purpose. Will. Will. It's about the will. It's about our will. Well, 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 Pastor, what is will? Uh, uh, it affects and, and is affected by our nature. Your will is affected by your nature. Not what that person says to try and tempt you. Not what that person puts in front of you to try and persuade you. It's your own nature that your will is affected by. We are all like that. We can always choose to say yay or nay. But it's our own. Is this all right? It is our own nature. Will. Will. W-I-L-L. -L. It is the power to make conscious, deliberate choices and then to remain focused and controlled as to what you're doing in relation to those conscious, conscious choices being brought into a real and tangible existence. I got that in my notes too. I need to read that again. That's why I like to write the sermon. Will. The power to make conscious, deliberate choices and then to remain focused and controlled as to what we're going to, to what we're going to do in relation to those conscious choices being brought into a real and tangible existence. In other words, what I come up with in my mind, I will that. And my nature affects it. If I have the nature to will it to become real before me, then I will will it. To become real. And that means I will choose to do what is required. By my own nature. Not by you tempting me. By your own nature. Not by me tempting you. That's the first rule of resisting temptation. What is your own will? Not the will of the tempter. Not the will of the thing that is tempting you. But what is your own will? Your will is affected by your nature. What is it about me that gives in to that? So we should search ourselves and ask ourselves, why do I always go back to that? I need to overcome that. Because the tempter is not going to stop tempting. That's the nature of the tempter. But the nature of the overcomer the nature of the overcomer is that I will not succumb to your temptation. I will not give in to your temptation. I will not go with what you're showing me I should be doing. 
No, no, no. And not only no, but now that I'm summoning my will by my own nature, nature, will, what's the next step for me to have life in God? I'm coming out of this mess completely. What do I need to do next to get closer to God? Will is also the act or experience of exercising the power to choose and to do. The things we choose to do or to not do says a lot about our nature. So when you say nature, you're talking about the natural man. And the natural man is now controlling the spirit man instead of the spirit man controlling the natural man. I let my nature take over. I get angry real easy, so you better not rub me the wrong way. That's the natural man. That's that messed up fella. So if I stop allowing him to rule, then I can begin to dialogue on a higher level with God because I will my nature to stay down. Where's Diane at? <laughs> what does she always say? I'm going to say it again. Stay down, Diane. Stay down. <laughs> she got it. Things we choose to do or to not do says a lot about our nature. Nature, uh, our nature is the kind of person we are. Uh, uh, tells and shows the world a lot about our spirit. Because if our nature is ruling, that says we got a weak spirit. We can be just twisted and turned any kind of way. Is that right? Says a lot about our spirit, whether it's risen and is in a personal relationship with Christ or not. Nature. What is nature? The combination of qualities and traits such as moral excellence, which distinguishes any person into their own uniqueness as relating to their personal faithfulness, trustworthiness, etc. That's what nature is, the combination of qualities and traits such as moral excellence, which distinguishes any person into their own uniqueness. Some people are just uniquely evil. Is that right? Because they listen to the dark side. Luke, it is your destiny. They listen to that evil side in them and give in to it. We as individuals are usually accepted by other persons or not based upon our intrinsic nature and morality. We're even raised with Christ or not based upon our own will. He's not going to invade you and say, nope, you got to get, you got to be saved. If we have the will, and I'm done, it's two minutes and I'm done now. If we have the will for Christ to change us or transform us from our old nature, which is controlled by the sinful thoughts of our flesh mind, then we must begin to let go of our nature of wanting to be in control of our life. want to be in control and by wanting to be in control we are out of control because we are in the natural and the natural that is not led by the spirit is out of control if we want to be what God wants us to be we've got to let go of control 
so that he can raise our spirit into the higher life where he's risen to, where Christ is. Then we will understand better what is meant whenever we hear a born-again brother or sister say, Christ is waiting for you right now to come to him and find new purpose and new life in him. We understand that when we release ourselves to God. Father, help us to be willing to let go of the old nature. Help us to reach out to you and you alone, not within ourselves. Not those things that say know yourself. But that part that says in you is hidden the treasure of treasures. Connect that to the know yourself, Lord. Help us to do that so that we can know when our nature is following the nature of this fallen world. And we can connect with the hidden treasure that's inside us and come to you with all hope and joy and expectation. We thank you for it. Bless every heart and every soul here right now that we can understand that if we allow our nature to control our will, we will stay fallen. Help us to be raised with Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a message, what a message. Awesome message. Whew. I'm here to open up the doors of the church.